inquiry. We don't have people on the ground who can look into it, what happened. These are the types of things we raise with the Israeli government uh, yeah. regularly. With respect to this specific one, I have just seen the report. So uh, before I offer any kind of detailed comment on it, I want to be able to look into it and confer with my colleagues about what any follow-up steps might be. Uh, my last question will be, any updates on how many trucks are entering Gaza now daily? Are, are they still at the 400 level? We have seen a significant increase in the, the number of trucks. They've gotten up to 400. Some days they've dipped back be, uh, below. For example, late last week, there were a few days uh, during Eid when it was hard to find truck drivers. So tr the, the level of deliveries dipped. We have seen, however, a steady increase in the number of trucks that are going into, um, uh, into Gaza. I, I would say it is not just the number of trucks, however, that we focused on. It's also where the trucks are going, um, ensuring that they get into northern Gaza. As you heard me say yesterday, um, uh, on Sunday, 65 trucks had gone into northern Gaza, and there were more planned for yesterday. I believe those trucks did move into northern Gaza. It's been ensuring that um, uh, Ashdod port is open. It now is open for humanitarian uh, deliveries. It's ensuring that bakeries, including bakeries in northern Gaza, can reopen. In the past 24 hours, we have seen bakeries reopen, which is important um, uh, for getting food directly to the, the Palestinian people. And so with all of these mechanisms, we are, have been working uh, to increase their capacity and make sure they are sustained. And we have seen improvement, not yet to the level where it needs to be. And certainly, it, once it gets to that level, we need to see it sustained over time. And that's how we're going to judge things. But we have seen some steady improvement over the past 10 days or so. Uh, follow-up? Yeah, go ahead. I said I'd come to Jenny next, but go ahead. Um, What's the follow-up, and then I'll come to you, Jenny. On trucks uh, going into Gaza, uh, is the is these numbers are these numbers based on Israeli figures? Uh, this is my first question. And secondly, Anwar released a report today saying that there has been no significant change in the volume of humanitarian supplies entering Gaza uh, or improved access to the north uh, since the beginning of April. They said an average of 881 eight trucks have crossed into Gaza per day. Uh, what is your assessment on this? In, in it seems that you know maybe Israel has taken some steps in this regard, but it seems it's not enough. It, do you agree? And also, uh, we'll follow up on that. Sure. So first of all, with respect to this dispute over trucks, part of it is counting different things, uh, and and not just counting a different way, but there are some uh, deliveries that happen that are commercial deliveries that the UN doesn't count because they're not part of the relief efforts that the UN monitors. So two things happen. Number one, uh, there are trucks that come in uh, through Rafa and through Karim Shalom that then are offloaded at Rafa and Karim Shalom and loaded onto UN trucks. And the UN diff uses different size trucks. So the UN counts their trucks, not the number of trucks that are coming in. It is a different, uh, a different way to actually measure the number of trucks. However, even that said, the UN number itself doesn't capture the entire daily volume because there are commercial trucks that are coming in, in some cases coming in directly through the north, through Erez, or um, are coming in through um, uh, the 96 gate crossing that they open, or are coming in through the south and driving up the, and are driving up internal roads. And those aren't counted, to my understanding, in the UN numbers because they're not being delivered through any of the UN agencies, through UNRWA um, or through the World, World Food Program or others. So the, the UN number does not count the total amount of, of delivery that goes in. Um, that said, I would agree with the overall assessment that we are not yet at the level we need to be. Very much agree with that. Um, but we have seen steady progress, and there are other things that are coming online. For example, this thing you've heard me talk about before, where there um, are, are trucks now that are making deliveries directly from Jordan, uh, coming through Israel, and then delivering directly into Gaza. That is happening. It's going to be increased as Israel makes certain improvements to traffic and clearing rubble and other debris that's blocking other uh, uh, the ability to sustain further traffic through some of these crossings that have recently opened. So. We've gone up. We see the pathway to going up more. We want to ensure that that's what actually happens, and that's what we're working every day to do. So that, um, that's a long-winded answer, I know, but it's a complicated th question. Th thank you. I appreciate it. Some reports say that you know quantity changed, in increased quantity of trucks changed, increased, but trucks are not fully loaded. Is this something that you also observe uh, and or raise with Israelis? I'm sure it's. I'm sure it is the case that some trucks are not fully loaded. I have a hard time kind of litigating this exact dispute where you know you look, I'm uh, uh, looking at every truck that goes in. 
But our, I will say our humanitarian experts who are on the ground have seen an increased volume, not just of trucks, but of humanitarian assistance going in. We have seen that over the past 10 days. Um, but that said, it's not enough and it needs to continue and it needs to be sustained. And that's what, that is uh, absolutely what we are working on every day. Jan, go ahead. Thank you. Two questions on Israel and Iran. It was reported that the Director General of IAEA said there were concerns that Israel would attack Iranian nuclear facilities. What is your opinion on this possibility? Uh, again, I'm not going to uh, engage with hypotheticals at all other than to say that we want to continue to avoid further escalation in the region. Uh, on Iraq? Well, just before we leave this, have you guys decided yet or made a determination about whether what Israel hit in Damascus was a diplomatic we, facility we, or not? We have not. We have not. So how long is this going to take? I can't answer that question. We're look, continuing to look into it. Um, I don't have a timetable, well, well, but it's well, something that we're... What more do you need to... Uh, uh, we need to, to gather enough information that will allow us to make an how? actual determination. Got, you have no one on the ground in Syria. We have arranged... Overtly, uh, as I said to you when uh, the last time you engaged with me on this question, we have an, uh, a range of abilities, a range of ways to gather information. They're partner countries of ours who yes. are on the ground. We have intelligence capabilities, off, uh, obviously. Um, and we're continuing to gather information, but we've not yet been able to yeah. determine. I, 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 I get it, but you were pretty quick into you know condemning the uh, you know the invasion of the Mexican embassy in uh, in, in, in Ecuador. That was a very clear, well-established embassy. And this is not very clear. Uh, where the, they the, blew up. The, this is something that is taking a little bit more time. No one to, died to in that incident. Uh, that's not the question. The question was, what is it? Is it was it an embassy or a consulate or not? And it was very yeah. clear. How in, in the, hard it's very is clear it to figure that out? In the case of the Mexican, it's something that we're gathering information it's been on. Like two weeks, uh, and we continue More. to gather information. We don't have a determination. Let me finish my second question on Iran. Certainly. Uh, what are the United States concerns about Iran working with North Korea to pursue nuclear weapons and the ballistic missiles? Certainly, that's something we'd be incredibly concerned about. Uh, so stay in the region? Yes. Yeah. Where, who said yes? Back there. Go ahead. I heard a yes. I couldn't see it. Go ahead. So the contents of the trucks going into uh, Gaza, are you talking to Israel about the contents of these trucks? Medical supplies are in um, Gaza is in major need of medical supplies. And some people on the ground are saying, yes, we're getting food, canned food, but we're not getting medical supplies. And one question about the West Bank. Two Palestinians were killed in Israeli uh, settlers' attack on the, some villages on the West Bank. Are you pressuring the Israeli government in regards to that, especially in light of Ben Gvir's um, open um, arming of settlers? So two things. First of all, um, with respect to your first question, um, we have been engaged with the Israeli government, and not just with the Israeli government, but with our partner countries in the region, as well as the various United Nations uh, agencies, about the importance of getting medical supplies into Gaza. They are very much needed. Um, and there have been medical supplies going in, uh, but not nearly enough. And it's been something that we've been incredibly focused on. We've also been working with um, uh, those partners to, to talk to the government of Israel to make sure that items that are legitimate medical items aren't excluded from deliveries. Uh, into Gaza, and that's something we'll, con we'll continue to do. And then with respect to the West Bank, we do remain incredibly concerned about uh, the increase in violence in the West Bank. I put out a statement on that yesterday. We've seen uh, tensions continue since then. We have made absolutely clear that the government of Israel has a responsibility to police extremist settler violence. It has the responsibility to hold extremist settlers responsible when they commit acts of violence. And as we have done in the past, if we don't see sufficient action, we are prepared to take actions of our own. But do you expect it to go out of hand? I'm not gonna make any predictions about what will happen in the future. We're incredibly concerned. One of the things that we have impressed upon Israel since October 7th is the importance of maintaining calm in the West Bank and that failing to properly hold settlers account accountable for their violence risks an escalation that isn't just harmful to the Palestinian people in, that live in the West Bank, but it's harmful to Israel's ultimate security and that it risks broader regional de-escalation. And so we've made the case of why it's in Israel's interest to take this matter incredibly seriously uh, and to hold people accountable for violent attacks, and we'll continue to do that. Michelle. 
Uh, Israel to alert the U.S. when they decide to retaliate? Uh, I'm just not going to deal with um, uh, uh, that hypothetical question. We are engaged with them closely um, about the need to avoid escalation in the region, but I'll keep those conversations quiet or uh, co confidential. Uh, it's been about a week and a half since the IDF uh, turned over its findings on the World Central Kitchen convoy strike. The U.S., you said, was reviewing it at the time. Has there been any assessment made on that? Uh, there hasn't been a final assessment. It, we are continuing to review the results of their investigation, and we're also continuing to engage not with the government of Israel about this question, but with humanitarian organizations to see what questions they have, um, and um, that process is ongoing. Are you still not calling for a separate independent We are not at this time. We're continuing to review those results and engage with the uh, humanitarian partners. When do you expect this review process uh, to wrap? I don't have a timetable. Go ahead. Uh, emphasize it's unwilling to escalate uh, it's the region and at the same time uh, you support uh, United States support Israel which occupied the Palestinian territories and in the same in the uh, it's which is the main and direct cause of the escalation and in, instability in the region why don't you why you ignore this reason and you work in different direction? I'm sorry, I think I missed, I missed, why do we ignore what? what? Why United States ignore this reason that the uh, occupation is the, the main reason and direct reason for the uh, escalation and the violence in the area? So first of all, I would say that um, it has long been our policy to see the establishment of an independent Palestinian state that predates October 7th. Um, but the pursuit of that policy has been something we have been engaged in vigorously since October 7th. You've seen the secretary travel to the region to engage with Arab partners uh, about putting on the table a real plan for normalization between Israel and its neighbors that would include a pathway to an independent Palestinian state and would establish real security for Israel. That said, and I think it's always important to emphasize this um, when this question comes up as it has before, Nothing that happened before October 7th justified the attacks of October 7th. Um, and I think it's always uh, important just to make that clear. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, one more. Uh, I wonder if you heard about what's happened today in Maghazi camp in Gaza, uh, the massacre, what's happened. And today, more uh, the most who killed there are children and women today, this morning. In Gaza. I, I, I have not uh, yet seen that report. I'm happy to, to look into it. Okay. Alex, go ahead. I have different questions. On. Sure, go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, let me start with the uh, question on uh, the report that you guys have submitted to the Congress yesterday uh, on compliance report on uh, arms agreement. Uh, there's a line there saying that the United States continues to provide Russia with pre launch notifications of ICBM and SLBM launches and notifications of heavy bomber exercises. Uh, in accordance with proper agreements, obviously, which remain you know, separate from, from New START. Um, is this a two-way road? And when last time this exchange had occurred? Can so, Alec, Alex, I'm going to make an admission here, which I have not read that report or am fully tracking the details. I'm happy to take that back and uh, look into the report's language and get back to you on it. Yes, please. Uh, I'm going to move to Georgia, if I may. Uh, I want to follow up on your previous comments. We were particularly directed to the Georgian Dream government. We were discouraging them from moving forward, but they did act anyway. Uh, but there are protesters out there, the second day in a row, uh, they're trying to save the democracy. What is your message to the protesters? Do they have your sympathy? I, I, I realize I'm you know, asking for bare minimum. Uh, so I'm going to say, first of all, with respect to that draft legislation, it does still remain draft legislation. And the past, last time um, this draft legislation was proposed, we saw it take several steps forward, but ultimately not pass into law. And so I don't think you're, um, we're at any point where we can make any predictions uh, yet about what's gonna uh, uh, gonna ha going to happen. But I will just reiterate that we do re remain deeply concerned about that law. And with respect to uh, protesters in Georgia or anywhere else in the world, uh, of course, the United States uh, supports everyone's right everywhere in the world to freedom of expression and freedom of speech. As you know, this is not the first time the initiators, same folks are initiating this you know, uh, Russian law and uh, what is your reaction to those who believe that those initiators are acting uh, in, in impunity while you are waiting for other shoes to drop? They are already taking the action that you can't reverse if you act later. Uh, so, Alex, I would say, as I, I would just refer you to the comments I made one moment ago, which is we have seen this legislation proposed before 
and not make it into law. It is still currently draft legislation. We've made very clear that we are concerned about it and as, opposed, as, um, as it pertains to any possible steps, I'm not gonna preview anything here. But I would say that is always the case where we do not preview potential sanctions or other measures that we might impose uh, before we do so. Thank you. I'm finally on Ukraine. I want to go uh, uh, back and forth yesterday. I'm sure you have seen President Zelensky's comments yesterday in which he made it clear that we can now see how unity can work truly 100% and, and how almost 100% of shahids and missiles can be intercepted. Um, you know, in fact, Ukrainian officials don't really understand why is it that the United States is not helping them directly to prevent uh, Russian attacks, at least you know, to the, uh, the targeting their energy infrastructure. So a few things. Number one, um, I saw the comments from the president very much understand where he's coming from. I would expect the president of any country who is under such withering attacks to um, look for any way possible to defend his people. Um, fully understand that. Um, number two, I think it is important to note the context that we have an entirely different relationship with Ukraine and Israel in that our relationship with Israel goes back decades and in terms of a security partnership. We have had a decades-long security partnership with Israel where we have been providing them direct military aid, not just going back two years of a conflict, but for decades, and have had long, broad-standing communications between our military and the Israeli military um, that, pr that goes back decades. Um, Israel is a major non-NATO ally of the United States. Ukraine is just in a different position in that we did not have that kind of agreement with them prior to the immediate months out, uh, before this conflict. But what you have seen us do since this conflict is um, provide them with the equipment they need to defend themselves. And that includes, of course, air defense systems, Patriot systems and other air defense systems that we have either provided the Ukrainian military ourselves or we have sourced from other partner and ally countries around the world so they can defend themselves. And much of the reason that they have been able to successfully defend themselves against barrage after barrage after barrage of Russian attacks is because of those air defense systems that we have provided. Now, that said, you're right that we are not in armed military conflict with Russia, which is what it would require for U.S. planes to be in the skies over Ukraine engaging with Russian attacks. And we are, are not going to be in direct armed conflict with Russia. The President of the United States has, been, has made that very clear. I think it's in the interest of the American people that we not be in direct armed conflict between the United States and Russia because we do not want World War III. That said, we are entirely committed to the defense of Ukraine. We have proved that over the past two years. The president has proved that um, by providing American support. And if you want to ask the question about what more we can do, the question is one to put to the United States Congress, because we have a supplemental spending bill that would allow us to provide more equipment, including more air defense systems to Ukraine that they very much need. And we hope that bill will pass. Go. Um on sanctions, do you have any update on reimposing Venezuela sanctions? The deadline for decision, I believe, is this Thursday. Uh, it is Thursday. It's, uh, it's uh, two days from now, the 18th. In my mind, I had it just tomorrow, but you're right, it is on Thursday. So um, we have made very clear, you saw when we allowed one of the licenses that we had given them with respect to the gold industry to expire in, I believe it was February, we made clear that there was another license uh, on their oil industry that was set to expire on April 18th. We are two days from April 18th. We have, been ma we have made very clear that if Maduro and his representatives did not fully implement their, ag their agreements under the Barbados Agreement, we would um, reimpose sanctions, and I would just say stay tuned. Do you think he's been moving towards green fair elections, which is part of that Barbados agreement? Uh, we, uh, he has upheld certain aspects of the Barbados agreement, including setting an election timetable and inviting international observation missions. At the same time, you've seen him uh, block candidates from the opposition from the ballot. So those are things that we take very seriously, and I don't want to make any announcements ahead of their time, but you should certainly stay tuned uh, over the next few days to see what more we will have to say uh, in advance of this deadline. And is there any concern that reimposing these sanctions could have some sort of impact or exacerbate irregular migration from that country? Uh, so uh, irregular migration is something we continue to work, to, uh, to work on uh, with our partners in the region. Um, but I don't want to answer that question in detail because it sort of presumes a policy choice that I'm not ready to announce it at this time. 
Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Last week, there was a meeting in, in Mexico between U.S. officials and, and Venezuelan officials. Do you have any details of what was discussed there? Or? Uh, I'm not going to comment on private diplomatic exchanges. Venezuela too, regarding that. I was, I was just saying, I was just saying but, but we have made very clear directly to uh, Maduro and his representatives that we expect them to uphold the things they agreed to under the Barbados Agreement. And, and on another meeting today here in Washington with Cuban authorities on, on migration, do you have any, any um, comments on what is being discussed and, and why is this meeting for? So uh, these were bilateral discussions between the United States and Cuba. They are um, uh, bilateral discussions on migration that take place biannually, twice a year. Um, they reflect the commitment by the United States to regularly review the implementation of the U.S.-Cuba Migration Accords, which date back to 1984. Uh, ensuring safe, orderly, humane, and regular migration between Cuba and the United States remains a primary interest of the United States, consistent with our interest in fostering family reunification and promoting greater respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms in Cuba. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, so what are some of the diplomatic measures uh, that the U.S. is doing uh, to de-escalate tensions since the Iran attack? Uh, so we are engaging in, uh, so uh, first of all, I, I, I want to say two things about that. One, we are engaging in diplomacy to make clear that we don't want to see de-escalation. So that's a message you've, the Secretary has delivered in his direct conversations uh, with his counterparts in the region. It's the message that others have delivered um, in their conversations with counterparts in the region, others from, from both our building and, and broader inside the administration. But there is another thing that we are doing, too, when it comes to diplomacy, and that is ensuring a coordinated diplomatic response to the unprecedented escalatory actions that Iran has taken. And you've seen the, the Secretary engage in conversations with his G7 counterparts. The President, of course, held a video call uh, with the leaders of the G7 <laughs> countries on Sunday, and it's something that we will continue to coordinate on in the days ahead. And, and as far as uh, the Arab countries like Jordan, uh, are, is there a strategy to help bolster them uh, since they took action in shooting down those drones? And so I'm going to let uh, uh, I'm going to let any country speak to its own actions. Go ahead. Yeah, there's, go ahead. A, there's a new Washington Post uh, report today about a six-year-old girl in Gaza City who was killed and the paramedics who went to rescue her. Uh, and that report finds that the ammunition matches that of Israel. Does the State Department have a new comment? You've spoken to it before said you've been in touch with the Israelis. Are you satisfied with their explanation? So I did read that report right before I walked out here to the podium. And I just want to say again that the death of Hein Rajab uh, is really an unspeakable tragedy, something that never should have occurred and never should occur. Um, when, this, when she first died and we saw the reports of her death, we raised the matter with the government of Israel directly. Um, they told us that they had conducted an investigation and found that there, are no, there were no IDF units in the area at the time of her death. I read the Post report, and the Post has concluded something to the contrary. Um, so what we're going to do is take the information that is contained in that Washington Post story. We're going to go back to the government of Israel and ask them for further inf information. We would still welcome a full investigation into this matter. Uh, and how it occurred in the first place. You've said repeatedly that there are processes that the State Department has, Admiral Kirby's referred to them as well. Is this one of those such processes where the United States has, could you do something independently here? So we do have processes ongoing to uh, look at various incidents. I have made it a practice never to confirm when a specific incident is under consideration as part of one of these processes, but there are a number of incidents that continue to be under review at the State Department. Um, uh, and that will continue to be the case. That is a separate matter than raising the question uh, with the government of Israel and asking what they have found, and that's what we've done in, in this case, and that's what we'll be going back to them to do with the new details that were raised by the Washington Post. And, and one more on aid, but the humanitarian peer uh, that DOD is leading on, uh, are you facilitating relationship with NGOs to, to make that, to get that aid into Gaza? We have been in conversation. Obviously, DOD is the lead for the construction of that pier and the operation of that pier. Um, but our special envoy, David Satterfield, as well as uh, officials in our embassy in Jerusalem, have been in engaged in conversations with the government Israel of Israel and various United Nations agencies and private relief organizations about the operation of that pier and how to ensure that aid that is delivered into Gaza over that pier can then be 
uh, properly and efficiently distributed inside Gaza, which of course has been one of the difficulties over the past couple of months uh, once aid actually is delivered. That's, that was, that's been true for uh, the delivery of aid over land routes, and what we're working to ensure is that it, that is not a, a problem for the delivery of aid through this new maritime corridor. Uh, go ahead. Talking about uh, with increasing concern about the um, Chinese uh, support for uh, Russian military industrial base, uh, um, so have you warned the Chinese against doing that, like you did a while ago when, to, when it comes to um, lethal aid, or are you planning any actions, you know, to to address that? And uh, <clears throat> separately, if I may, <clears throat> Polish President Duda. Uh, said today that he will meet with um, former President Trump. That's obviously uh, um, uh, another you know, meeting after um, uh, David Cameron met with him and, and the Ukrainians expressed uh, interest in that. Uh, how are you concerned at all about you know, these, these um, meetings? There, there might be some shadow diplomacy or something like that. Um, I don't have any comment on, on those meetings other than to say that we have seen um, over the course of years of American elections where uh, foreign governments engage with the nominees of major parties here, just as American diplomats and American leaders often engage with um, foreign opposition leaders. The secretary has regularly engaged with the opposition leader in Israel. He met with the opposition leader um, uh, from uh, the United Kingdom when he was in Munich in February. So that's something that has happened over decades between um, between governments of, of various parties in the United States and, and in other countries. Um, with respect to your first question, remind me. Chinese. Oh, with, with China. Um, so we have long made clear to uh, the People's Republic of China that we would have concern with any actions that they took to support Russia's war in Ukraine. And that does not include, that doesn't, that doesn't have to just be direct military support, but that we would be incredibly concerned about them, about any steps taken by Chinese companies to reconstitute Russia's defense industrial base. And so what we have seen over the past months is that there have been materials moving from China to Russia, that Russia has used to rebuild that reindustrial base, uh, and produce arms that are showing up on the battlefield in Ukraine. And we are incredibly concerned about that. And you saw the secretary engage with NATO foreign ministers about that week before last. Uh, it will certainly be on the agenda uh, when he uh, travels to the G7 tomorrow um, to meet with G7 partner countries. And then the only thing I will say uh, further about that is the Secretary does plan to travel to China in the coming weeks, and you can certainly, uh, without getting too far ahead of those meetings, you can certainly uh, expect that that is an issue that uh, he would be expected to raise. Uh, go ahead. Regarding Venezuela again, because we have seen that President Gustavo Petro from Colombia, he has been engaging with Maduro, for instance, last week, at the same time that the U.S. officials were meeting with uh, representatives from the Maduro government in Mexico, he was meeting with Maduro in Venezuela. How important has been the role of President Gustavo Petro, and do you believe that he is aligned with the U.S. towards Venezuela and sanctions? Uh, let me take that back and get you a comment. All the way in the back. Yeah. Um, can you provide any information or comment on the assurances that the U.S. has given the High Court in London on the proposed extradition of Julian Assange? I would defer to the Department of Justice on that question. Is the U.S. working on a possible plea deal in this case, and is that something that the Australian government has asked for? Uh, when it comes to plea deals or any other matters of ongoing cases, I'm going to defer to my colleagues at the Justice Department, who um, should be the ones to, to comment on that. Although I expect what they'll say is you can look to their court filings for any comment, but still. Is still this something other. that the U.S. has been discussing with the Australian government? Uh, again, I'm just going to defer to the Department of Justice. Go ahead. Pakistan has initiated discussions with the IMF uh, over a new multi-billion uh, dollars loan agreement. Uh, Pakistani Prime Minister is here and seeking U.S. help in terms of investments. Um, 
is U.S. supporting or can support Pakistan in these challenging times? So we welcome last month's announcement that the IMF has reached a staff level agreement with Pakistan. We understand, the, uh, as you said, the Pakistani Minister of Finance is in town uh, here in Washington for meetings uh, at the IMF and World Bank. Pakistan has made progress to stabilize its economy, and we support its efforts to manage its daunting debt burden. We encourage the government to prioritize and expand economic reforms to address its economic challenges. Our support for the country's economic success is unwavering, and we will continue to engage with Pakistan through technical agreements as well as through our trade and investment ties, all of which are priorities of our bilateral relationship. So Indian Prime Minister Modi and his defense minister has said, uh, have said in a campaign speech that the new India will not hesitate to cross borders to kill terrorists. They are kind of confessing to the assassination of Niger in Canada, Panu's murder to hire plot in New York, and killings in Pakistan. Is this statement a concern for Biden? Uh, so as I have said before, the United States is not going to get in the, into the middle of this, but we do encourage uh, both India and Pakistan to avoid escalation and find a resolution through dialogue. So in the past, United States has imposed sec sanctions on individuals from foreign countries involved in, in assassination attempts here in United States. Um, but we don't see similar actions against India. What is the reason of this? apparent relaxation. So uh, I am never going to preview um, uh, any sanctions uh, actions, which is not to say that there are any coming. But when you ask me to talk about sanctions, it's something that we don't uh, we don't discuss uh, uh, openly. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Matthew. I wanted to ask about Qatar. Uh, it sounds like they have prior ties to Hamas. So does the Biden administration see them as a reliable mediator with Hamas now? So you have heard the secretary speak to this on a number of occasions. Uh, and you heard the president speak to this after we achieved the humanitarian pause back in November that got more than 100 hostages out. We were able to achieve that in great effect because of the work that Qatar did to help us get those hostages out. Qatar has played an incredibly important role in helping get hostages out already. And they have played an incredibly important role in the back and forth negotiations with Hamas uh, over the past few months to try and reach uh, a further ceasefire deal that would get the remaining hostages out. Um, so uh, I would just say with respect to Qatar, um, they have been a close partner in this process. They continue to be. Um, and uh, it is because of their work that we've already seen hostages come home. Do you feel like they've done the most they can do? Uh, they have done an incredible, an incredible amount of work. Yes, they have done everything that they can do to try and get these hostages home. Uh, and we continue to engage with them. This, as I said, the secretary spoke with the prime minister and foreign minister of Qatar earlier today to talk about um, uh, the latest iteration of a possible hostage deal. And when it comes to um, the impediment to hostage agreement, it's not Qatar. Not Egypt, it's not Israel right now. It is Hamas. It is Hamas that has refused to agree to the deal that is on the table, despite the fact that it would achieve much of the things that they have publicly claimed in repeated statements that they are trying to achieve. Go ahead. 